Time for Fowler's Facts. We bring in our statistician, Clinton Fowler, but we might be able to stump you this time. We don't have any historical data on SMX races because we haven't had one yet, but you did try to at least break down the Speedway Supercross race we've had at Daytona and Atlanta. Does that show you anything that we could maybe extrapolate from? What's the numbers show? I, th I think so, Weege, but you know, you guys can, you guys can test me here. So I, I took a look at what our SMX racers have done at Speedway venues. So at Daytona and Atlanta Motor Speedway versus when they're at the stadiums. Um, and there's a couple of things that, that jump. First things first, Cooper Webb, he's coming back for the playoffs. Um, he averages 2.3 positions better in a Speedway venue. So pretty impressive there. In the 11 times he's raced at either Atlanta Motor Speedway or Daytona, he's been on the podium eight of those times. So maybe that's just East Coast dirt and he's just pumped to be back home and, and comfortable, but he's showing a pretty significant advantage there. And then the other two, Chase Sexton and Dylan Ferrandis, those guys both have a 1.6 position advantage in the speedways versus non-speedway venues. So some fairly decent changes in the positive. And then JT, there's one that doesn't, which is Jason Anderson, and he's one position worse. But the thing for me is, you know, we're looking at pretty unique tracks, JT. Um, some pretty big differences in those. What do you think? Where's your head at on this? You know, I think the Cooper Webb, there could be something there. I always look at, you know, what are his strengths and what are his liabilities? Um, you know, Supercross whoops have always been a question mark. Right. He's been better at other times than other. You no, know, but he's it's an area he's really worked on. They've done tons and tons of testing over the years to improve there. But when you think about these speedway venues and more importantly, these SMX playoff rounds, we're not going to have those stadium style supercross whoops. So I think that really plays into his hand. And you also you think about this first race. This is a home race for him, Charlotte. Right. He doesn't live there anymore, but this is where he grew up friends, family. This is a guy that thrives off of the spotlight and the pressure and those things. So I think you're going to see a really, really strong Cooper Webb. And the, the speedway factor just adds another uh, checkbox to that. Uh, I'm going to disagree. Uh, I think that uh, web strength when we go to Atlanta and Daytona are the dirt kind of breaks down and they're longer races and he can use his craftiness of picking lines. And yeah, the whoops are gnarly at the beginning of the day, but by the end, it's just a, a bomb field through there. I think these are going to be high speed, and I don't think that that's Webb's strength. His strength is those tight inside corners. I don't know if that's going to develop. So who knows, actually. And JT, I want to ask you about this. Anderson, the number being lower at the speedways, I feel like we've seen Anderson ride very well at the speedway races. Maybe the results just don't show it. Yeah, and sometimes you can just get a result or two in there that skew it, right? You think about how great he was at Atlanta 2022. He beats a, maybe an injured Eli Tomac. He was a little wounded there. But then at 2023, he DNFs the Atlanta round. So the results don't always tell the picture, but I think you can find trends there. Um, I think the, the real question for Anderson is, can he find the magic of 2022? Because he simply did not have that in, in a speedway or in a stadium in 2023. Okay, so that's 450s, couple guys to watch there. What about the 250 class on this speedway data, Clinton? Yeah, we, there's there's two guys that stick out for me. Uh, one we've been talking about all year, maybe maybe too much at times. Hayden Deegan uh, has a two and a half position advantage in the speedways. Obviously, this is a place where you can get skewed results. He's a rookie, he's got 10 starts. Two of those starts though are Atlanta and Daytona, and both of them, he was on the podium. He got third place in both of those races. Um, and in non-stadium or in non-speedways, he's got a 5.5 average versus that three third place average. So there's some some advantage there. I could see him using this to to hype up his own his own uh, confidence here, pre prepping into the the playoffs. And the other one on the other end of this the the, the stick here, the other end of the spectrum is Seth Hamaker. Um, he averages 4.4 in a traditional stadium. He's averaging 6.8 in a speedway. So um, not optimal to, to drop two positions there. But again, he's only raced 11 Supercrosses. He's had some injuries um, in the Supercrosses. So guys, he's had, JT, he's had some success in those Supercrosses, but the Speedways just haven't treated him quite as nice. He's had a couple of rough finishes with a ninth and 11th. So it's interesting for these young guys with a little less experience. Uh, I don't know what to expect from him, JT. 
I expect the world from Hayden Deegan. Uh, I think he could come in and absolutely win this thing. You look at how much better he's gotten. And remember those first few rounds, I think about Houston, there was so much learning going on, right? He was trying to find his place and figure things out. That's not the Hayden Deegan we saw as the series rolled on. And forget about pro motocross, he was a entirely different animal. So I think we're gonna see Hayden Deegan kind of buck all the trends that we've seen and he will be a podium contender right out of the get-go. And as for Seth Hamaker, yes, he's got a smaller sample size and that 11th really stands out um, that it wasn't so great, right? It throws the results off. But I look at Seth and if he can get the starts, which he is very, very proficient at, and don't forget we saw Monster Energy Pro Circuit Kawasaki really vault up in those starts late in the season. Mitch Payton talked about it just before Southwick. They found an engine setting that really changed the game for them as far as starts. So I think Seth, with that starting prowess, with that upgraded engine package could be a factor and be a sleeper in this series that nobody's really got on their bingo card as of now. Yeah, I think he could uh, make a name for himself at these races. But I guess, Clinton, the hardest thing is, have you ever had a race where you have so little data going in? It's definitely, I've had to search. I've had to search into the database to see what I could come up with for predictions. So it's going to be tough. But I mean, like anything, the 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 best rise to the top at, at times like this and playoff races here. I think I think we're gonna see these guys step it up a, a notch. Yeah, that's what we love. When even our statistician isn't sure what stats to pick from, that means the riders, teams, and fans and us don't know what to expect. That's what we like. We'll see you next week, Clinton. Thanks, Weech. Thanks, JT. All right, that's it. We've been building this up for over a year now. At 11 a.m. on Friday, we'll have a live press conference, and then we'll have bikes on track at noon on Friday in Charlotte. This is it, JT. The playoffs are finally here. And one more time, if you want to watch Race Day Live, we'll be back. That starts at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time with Dan Hubbard and Ryan Villapoto and plenty of other guests. 2.30 Eastern is our pre-race show. We're racing at 3 o'clock Eastern. You can watch all of it on Peacock or the Super Motocross video pass outside of the U.S. or on television at 3 p.m. Eastern on USA Network. Hi, folks. Lee Diffie from NBC Sports here. If you truly enjoyed what you just watched, you can get more news, interviews, and highlights by subscribing to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube page. You can get it all, so go for it.